Where is there a more sinful spot to be found upon our guilty globe? By Samuel Davies When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? Amos 3, 6 It concerns us all to seriously reflect upon our own sins and the sins of our land, which have brought these calamities upon us. We and our countrymen are sinners, aggravated sinners. God proclaims that we are such by his judgments now upon us, by withering fields and scanty harvests, by the sound of the trumpet and the alarm of war. O my country, is not your wickedness great and your iniquities infinite? Where is there a more sinful spot to be found upon our guilty globe? Pass over the land, take a survey of the inhabitants, inspect into their conduct, and what do you see? What do you hear? You see the gigantic forms of vice bidding defiance to the God of heaven, while true religion and virtue are forced to retire to avoid public contempt and insult. You see herds of drunkards swelling down their cups and drowning all morality within them. You hear the swearer venting his fury against God, trifling with that name which prostrate angels adore, and imprecating that damnation under which the hardiest devil in hell trembles and groans. You see avarice hoarding up her useless treasures, dishonest craft planning her schemes of unlawful gain, and oppression unmercifully grinding the face of the poor. You see prodigality squandering her stores, you see luxury spreading her table. You see vanity, laughing aloud and dissolving in empty, unthinking mirth, regardless of God, of time and eternity. You see sensuality wallowing in carnal pleasures and aspiring with perverted ambition to sink as low as her four-footed brethren in the stalls. You see cards more in use than the Bible, the backgammon table more frequented than the table of the Lord, novels and romances more read than the history of the blessed Jesus. You see trifling and even evil diversions and amusements become a gigantic business. The outcome of a horse race is more anxiously attended to than the concerns of eternity. And where these grosser forms of vice do not shock your senses, you often meet with the appearances of a more refined impiety, which is equally dangerous. You hear the conversation of reasonable creatures of candidates for eternity, engrossed by trifles or vainly wasted on the affairs of time. These are their important subjects of conversation, even at the threshold of the house of God. You see swarms of prayerless families all over our land. You see ignorant, wicked children, unrestrained and untaught by those to whom God and nature have entrusted their souls. You see the holy religion of Jesus, abused, neglected, disobeyed, and dishonored by its professors. You see crowds of professed believers who are, in reality, practical atheists. These nominal Christians are really unholy heathens. They are abandoned slaves of sin who yet pretend to be the servants of the holy Jesus. You see multitudes lying in a deep sleep in sin all around us. You see them eager in the pursuits of the vanities of time, but stupidly unconcerned about the important realities of the eternal world just before them. So few are concerned what shall become of them when all their connections with earth and flesh must be broken and they must take their flight into strange, unknown regions. So few lamenting their sins, so few crying for mercy and a new heart, so few flying to Jesus.